Good. Yeah, sometimes I can't find words, so. Yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Part of being older. Yes. I like that phrase, older, not old. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, here we go. How and why did you get involved in cult-related matters? Well, I uh, got involved in a large group awareness training. Um, it was 1978, and um, I was involved with that for uh, five years. I was uh, doing ending hunger briefings because an offshoot of the large group awareness training was an end hunger um, organization. And um, um, both myself and my husband were trained in how to do ending hunger briefings. So um, then my husband's daughter, my second husband, my husband's daughter um, was behaving extremely not like herself. and. I was, uh, she, she had said that for a while that she had been in the Hare Krishna. And so I started doing some research because I knew that Hare Krishna was uh, considered a cult. And the more research I did, especially about um, having, using trance states as a way of making, um, using undue influence on a person and um, the more I read, the more bells and whistles went off and we left the group that we were involved in and that's how I got involved. I started going to CAN meetings and I served on the board of CAN, the Cult Awareness Network. Um, and I also got very active in uh, a support group founded by former members of cults and that was called FOCUS. And then after, uh, I just, I was on the board of CAN for three years, and I had, had been hearing about AFF, American Family Foundation. So I, um, I didn't attend any meetings right away, but um, we had a large misunderstanding with the Cultural Awareness Network when they dismissed our board of directors and we knew that we were not owned by CAN. So I was very, very upset and then I met Herb Rosedale at a conference and started talking to him and he was so supportive and Michael, I met Michael later and he was so supportive and um, I just got very interested in the work that they were doing started attending, they were, they didn't have a board, but they had like a, um, an advisory board. And um, they had meetings up in, in New York State, and I was living on Long Island, so we started attending those whenever we could, and got active in helping other former members. and. That was the beginning of it. So that was about 1990, 1991. Actually, it may have been sooner than that, but I think it, it was, was around that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what specific programs were you involved in? Well, the specific programs were helping former members when they had the, um, the conferences up, up in um, New York. And at, at that point in time, um, Herb Rosedale and Michael asked me if I would be willing to take, uh, be in charge of the former member programs. So I was appointed uh, the director of, of former member programs. And uh, project outreach which was to get uh, to help to get some former members to be part of of AFF as well and then uh, eventually when AFF um, had a board of uh, 
directors, I was served on that board. Mm -hmm. How did AFF, or later ICEF, uh, influence, you, your, influence your approach to uh, the counseling you were doing? I, I would hate to say it, but I think it was the other way around because I was very, very protective of former members. And, um, you know, I just insisted that when we had former member activities that only former members were allowed to attend. And so that was different for, um, for uh, AFF. I just call it, I call it ICSA. Sure. <laughs> but um, it was different for them, and I kind of had to you know, encourage her by telling him why. I felt it was much safer for former members if, if, if there weren't people there to, that they felt uncomfortable with. Um, so that's. And, and I have to say that they, they stood, once they understood there was a safety issue, um, they, because people would come to uh, events, as former members would come to events, and get triggered. We were seeing that an awful lot, and it was um, upsetting. So, you know, we, but we had reasons. We kept, kept developing the program so that there were less and less possibilities or less and less people having um, triggers that were very upsetting. They still get triggers to this day, but they're not as um, violent as some of the ones that we saw early on. And I think in part that was because we, we kept changing the program so out of the needs of the former members as they were expressed the year before, well, let's, okay, well, how can we make this better? And that's how the, the whole uh, program, especially the um, recovery workshops that we, we developed. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, how was your, um, if at all, your sort of, what can I say, intellectual approach towards uh, the problems? Uh, uh, did uh, AFF, ICEF, uh, views, let's just say, uh, Mike's and her views, you, did, did it um, uh, affect your approach? We'll talk about your therapeutic approach, your, your intellectual approach. Uh, actually, if at all. yes, it, it definitely did, because having been involved with, with CAN, with Cult Awareness Network, it was more of a black and white view. And it was, it was, you know, kind of like in this box, and if you went outside of it, that's not a cult. You know. um, but AFF, Michael, and um, and her especially, that I was closest to them, and some of the other people that were involved, it was like, you know, well, let's, you know, it, it's not black and white because different cults use some of the same techniques, but maybe some of those techniques were done in a harsher way and others weren't. So it was, I needed to take that black and white approach out of my, my head as well and to really study and understand. And so part of it was the approach of, um, of Michael and, and Herb and others that were getting involved then. And part of it was watching how people were relating to information in the recovery workshops and in the programs that we had before the workshops developed. So it was more observation and an expanding an understanding of, of what really happens inside these groups. You uh, described how um, you influenced the um, uh, uh, approach toward uh, uh, former members uh, in the various uh, workshops and programs. Um, 
Was there anything else uh, that you uh, uh, felt that uh, AFF and ISEP were doing uh, that wasn't productive as it might have been? Well, I felt that they, that the programs that they actually expanded just to involve former members. I mean, because originally when I got involved, the former members weren't, weren't a big, big deal. Um, but then when Gann went down, um, we started having conferences. And more and more former members are coming to the conferences. And, and so I believe that what was really important for the administration of, of uh, ICSA to, to include former members and to, because they had already in, in, um, included families who had someone in. And so this was just another branch off that, that they developed. And, and I just feel like they're so smart and so observing, and they will listen. I was amazed that they actually listened to me, um, and because that wasn't true in, in the Coherence Network. Yeah. So I, I was just so pleased to have this ability to help former members and, mm -hmm. and to be supported by an organization that I think, I think, is one of the most pleasing and um, useful organizations that I've ever had yeah. the, the pleasure of being part of. Yeah, yeah. And I watch this development too from a distance, and it's, uh, it's remarkable. Have um, culture groups or groups that uh, um, practice unethical manipulation, social and psychological. Did they come after you and try to uh, harm you in any way, your reputation or your very existence? Oh yes. <laughs> um, I was I, I was doing bef before and even part of the time that I was involved with um, ICSA. I was doing interventions, and um, and I also appeared on a few television programs, and you know, all kinds of interviews and things like that. And I wrote um, some articles and had them on my own website. And so, uh, of course, the one main organization that goes after people, um, Scientology, came after me, and they said that I was a deprogrammer. And they called me in on, I had to uh, appear twice for, uh, on legal cases. And I had to find, it, uh, by that time we had moved to Florida. So I had to find a lawyer to represent me. And, uh, you know, who I could, nobody understood what cults were, that I, yeah, and when I looked for the lawyers, and this younger lawyer was actually um, willing to learn. So I sat down with him and, and we talked, and he represented me twice. But what uh, Scientology did was during the interviews, they asked me questions about, tell me, uh, they, wanted, they wanted all my records on deprogrammed cases. So I gave them nothing. They wanted all my record, all my uh, information, um, and how I got clients um, that for deprogrammers. And every time they used the word deprogramming, I responded, "I'm sorry." To find the word deprogramming for me, and they did. And I said, "I'm sorry, I don't do that," because. I refused to do anything that was uh, without a person's permission to speak with me. Anyway, um, 
And then they both, all in the, their newsletters and everything, they would always say I'm a deprogrammer and that I actually, um, the money that I gave for dues to the Cult Awareness Network was, um, was came from deprogrammers. So, you know, they just twisted everything. Were you, were you charged with, uh, did they charge you with any civil crime? No, they didn't. They didn't, they didn't have any, any. Right. But it must have been trying for you. Yeah. I mean, Jack Clark went through this, you know, I was with him at the time, and it was really, uh, what can I say, uh, really damaging to his psyche. Yes. Me too. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and they, they, uh, <clears throat> there was another, we're gonna, oh, the group that I was in, um, I had a website and I put um, an article on them, on my website. And they contacted AOL and, and demanded that it be taken off and AOL took my website down. And then I removed that article from my website and they allowed me to put it back up. But, um, and, and then they, they started to sue me. However, the attorney in New York City, uh, what happened to be a friend and grad, former graduate with Herbert Rosedale. So Herbert Rosedale had a little talk with him and they removed the laws. <laughs> uh, those are the only two that I had any legal problems with. Right, right. How do you think we can reach out uh, to uh, the, uh, the younger people? who are getting involved in uh, uh, educational work or professional work uh, that's relevant to AFS and ISF. Like, there seem to be a lot of young people here now. Yes, so there are. Any, any ideas uh, on that? Or? Yes, um, and I, I believe that they already have reached out to quite a few, and um, especially the second generation, or multi-generation former members, um, their needs and um, the things that they suffer afterwards are are stronger than what those who became part of the group. And I'm not going to say join the group because I don't believe anyone joins a cult. Um, they get they get undue influenced into yeah, a yeah, yeah. situation that they did not right. know existed. Right. They were lied. And so anyway, I think, I believe that um, they are reaching out. And um, no, I don't think they're really reaching out. They're listening and they're, they're giving programs to these people. And they, you know, a lot of former members study in the um, therapy business. And yeah. they are invited to take part in so I, I just think it's very important. I think it's also important for them to listen to any complaints or um, situations that we feel can be corrected for the programs in, uh, for former members. And the more that former members see an organization that will listen to them and respond, the more interested in them. But you got to remember to take in the fact that people who are just getting out of cults do not have very much finance. How are you financed? I mean, just in living. Um, my husband. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I was volunteer. And that's not entirely true. But for a few years, I did work three days a week um, for ICSA, uh -huh. um, doing news articles and you know collections. And, I remember that. Yes. yes. Yeah. Making copies of old tapes and. Yeah. 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 yeah that's right. I, I, I faded away, but for a few years, I was doing. We were we were in the same uh, 
took it getting articles and not having them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. Very, very useful stuff for this history and this advice. Thank you very much.